we're going to go to the Gospel of Matthew in the ninth chapter, and I want to deliver this message so I can get it off of me since I got it this morning. Um, in Matthew's Gospel, the uh, ninth chapter, and I want to read a few verses there in the New King James reading, and it begins in verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the city and the villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were wearied and scattered. Somebody say wearied and scattered. Like sheep having no shepherd, then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Here it comes, verse 38. Therefore, because they're wearied and scattered, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. And all the people said, amen. amen. The subject this morning, Amber Alert, the compassion of Jesus. The compassion of Jesus. We are all familiar with that sound. And when you hear it, the Amber Alert sound, when you hear it, something begins to trickle inside of you. Yeah, that sound. That sound sends a chill into your body. Anyone that has a phone or anyone that has a, any type of device that is connected to the internet, your phone starts going off. Strangely enough, someone's phone will go off before your phone goes off. But sooner or later, the Amber Alert will hit your phone and you start wondering. The selfishness of most of us is that we know that it doesn't involve us. So we hear the Amber Alert with the desensitized personality that, well, I know my family is all right. Us. But to many of us, we begin to pray automatically. Lord, I rebuke death. I rebuke sickness. Bring that child back home. I rebuke any, any, act, any tragedy. And then I plead the blood because it's an alert. It sounds an alarm for you and I to respond. The Amber Alert is sounding now. Jesus is a compassionate savior. He's a compassionate savior because he sees there's a response that he's given to his disciples because there are people missing. And there are people online this morning and we miss you. And some are not even tuned into a Christian station this morning, but we miss them. So I come to put the Amber Alert in you. For you to go to any store or any place you're at and sound the alarm that the Lord is coming back. And you need to not be getting ready, but be ready. This text gives us a lot of substance and meaning. Uh, in verse 13 of the ninth chapter, he declares that I didn't come for righteous folk, but I came in verse 13, is I came to call the sinners to repentance. Then he speaks of a change in disposition, a dispensation of old garments, old wine, new wineskin, new wineskin, new bottles, a dispensation of changing. He goes on and he deals with the faith of the Gentile, um, of, of the daughter that was sick, and he raised her up, speaking of Israel being raised back up, even though she was sick. In the same context, he talks about the woman had the issue of blood, the Gentiles, pressing their way through and touching the hem of his garment. He's building his case. He moves on in verse 28 down to verse 29. He talks about the dumb and deaf. Then he says, do you believe I'm able to do this? He is moving. Say, Jesus is moving. He's bringing us to our text this morning in verse 34. For the Pharisees of the ninth chapter of Matthews, for the Pharisees said that he, he was casting out devils through the prince of devils. They did not recognize his power, did not, did, not, did not have to be backed up by Satan's power. He had all power. 
So he was casting out devils. And when devils are cast out, they got to find some place to go. They look for dry places, unsaved believers, people that have no power. And they come and stick up their house with you. That's why it's good to have the Holy Ghost. Oh, come on here, somebody. It's good to have Christ in your life. I want you to track with me in verse 35 now of the ninth chapter of Matthew. And he says, and Jesus went about all the cities. He was on the move, every village. Teaching in their synagogues or churches or place of gatherings. Preaching the kingdom, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, wherein that the gospel of the kingdom represents the king who rules and brings power and authority. In this preaching and teaching, there was demonstration, not just preaching and teaching. The Bible says he healed every sickness and every disease among the people. I believe Jesus wants us healed of every sickness and every disease, physically or spiritually. Anytime Jesus is present, healing is present. Amen. People were sick, they were diseased with various diseases, various sicknesses, but he was healing them. But his 36th verse woke me up again this morning. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. If he could have healed them, he would have. But he was just moved, yearning within his being about this crowd of people having no shepherd. The compassion of Jesus is an urgent need to bridge the gap of every generation. We are in a generation gap now wherein the silent generation is slowly, beautifully slipping off of our scene. The boomers and the late boomers and the millennials and the X and the Ys and the Gen Zs, the smaller generations, they're coming on the scene. We bless babies because parents want the children's blessed. And we say in the baby blessing that the child can't drive itself to church. But when we look up after the baby blessings, mama's here, but the baby's at home. So how are we gonna bridge the generation if you don't bring them to church? They stay with grandma's house to eat on Friday and Saturday, but they stay there on Sunday watching TV. If we stayed on Friday and Saturday, guess where we were going on Sunday? To a church. It doesn't matter what you got, you going to church. I'm not ready to go to church. Oh, you going to church. As for me and my house, we going to, everybody in this house is going to church. If you can't come to this church, you got to go to some church. You hung out with your buddies and your girlfriends and your besties all Saturday. You had a great time. Y'all laughed. Y'all kicked it. Y'all did whatever. You had great fun. But now it's Sunday morning and you say, well, I'm going to church. Where are you going? No. Bring them with you. If they can hang out with you, they can also come up in here. Young man, good friend of mine, and he told me a couple of day, just a couple few days ago, he said, he says, you know what, uh, my, my, my son just turned 15, and he's all messed up about God, and about church, and about Jesus. I said, well, does he ever go to church? Well, his mother doesn't take him to church. She doesn't believe in religion or, or organized religion at all. I said, why wouldn't you, why were not you bringing it? Well, you know, we're not together anymore. He lived with his mama. So, uh, but now I see that this boy about to go crazy. I got to get him in church quick. That's an amber alert. That's when you know we got to move now quickly because this child may not make it if we don't get them in church. Compassion of, 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 of abridging the next generation. That's where we are now. We're trying to bridge that generation. My heart is, is heavy with grief this morning because I'm, I'm pure and looking through the congregation and someone gave a bad message that, that our church is for the old folk. Look, somebody said the devil is a liar. <laughs> I, play, I, ain't, I ain't old, I'm just better. So what do you mean the church is for the old? We've had three decades of ministry plus, and we've seen youth department grow and swell, and youth pastors come and go, and we've seen ministry excel and go. New babies are being born in the church. So what's happening in this season, in this time? I talked to a football coach when I was in at the council just a few days ago, and I asked him, I said, what are you guys doing for youth? He said, young people in this generation are in the council generation. 
they'll just counsel you. They don't want to do anything, sadly so. Most of them, not all of them. He says, I'm a football coach. He said, I can't even get kids to sign up for football. Let's learn any other sports. They don't want to do that. All they want to do all day long is just sit there and tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And guess what the grown folk are doing? And when you find something interesting, that's when you stop on that. And I know it only has you about three seconds because you're going to go to the next. Scrolling. Merging those generations is what we need to do. Jesus had overwhelming compassion and pity on the people. His pity was so rich and so deep that he wanted to see something done for them and with them. He responds, he responds this great echo to us. Deep inside of us should be a mercy for people, and it should be the mercy that God has given us. In Ezekiel, he begins to talk in the Old Testament and rebuke them because of their lack of concern for the people that were scattered abroad. The shepherds took things onto themselves and forgot about the people. I never want to get so comfortable in how God has blessed us that we forget about somebody's out there still needs Jesus. There are souls that still need to be saved. We are not finished yet. Why would we say that, well, we, well, we don't need to bring anybody else in. We said, we said that until you came, and now since you came, we don't need to bring nobody else in. Oh, yes, we do. How many know five young people right now that need to be saved? I don't know who you know, but you know them. And if they're near you to get them, then go and bring them, witness to them. I wish right now we could have a social media break and you could just tell your phone out and just inbox or what's they call it, MD, DM. Somebody tell them, get to church right now. The scattered generation, why? Lord, were they scattered because they were not fed properly. Scattered because they had false shepherds. Scattered because they themselves did not feed properly. The shepherds clothed, them, clothed themselves, Ezekiel says. He said they also took everything onto themselves and forgot about the people. They did not build them up when they were weak. They did not heal the sick. They did not doctor the injured. They did not go to see about those that were, went astray. They did not look for the loss. They bullied and they ran over those that were innocent. They did not take atten pay attention to their needs. Ezekiel 34 is what I'm talking out of. Jesus says, I'm going to get them for this because they took it on themselves. So I myself are coming to be the true shepherd. I'm gonna show you what a shepherd looks like. I'm gonna show you what a shepherd was to be. I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna lead and guide you. And the shepherd goes out and leaves the 99, picks up the one and bring that one home. And I was that one lost sheep. Remembering how he picked me up and brought me in and saved me makes me go back and do a little forest gumping and pick somebody else up and bring them in. So I'm doing some gumping this morning and I'm trying to get you to gump with me and go back and get Sergeant Dan, who was, I'm sorry, my another story, another movie. All right, come on, come back. But help me go and pick somebody up and bring them in. They were scattered because the shepherds did not give attention to them or care about them. The food they needed, they did not get. But I wanted you to see as I move through this message in Ezekiel 34, verse 5 and 6. He said, they were not fed, but they were scattered among wild beasts of the field. We are in a place where we are among wild beasts of the field. The sheep wandered, the text says in Ezekiel 34, they wandered through mountains and in every high hill. Yes, my sheep were scattered over the whole face of the earth. They're 
scattered everywhere. Hmm. How many ever broke a jar or a glass in the house on a hard floor? And you swept it up, you cleaned it up, you got it up. But after all that, don't you hold on, let me preach. <laughs> after all that, you still saw a piece of on the floor. God is saying in this text, I don't care how much you think they're not, you can find people anywhere. They're everywhere looking to be picked up, looking for somebody to give them a word to change their lives forever. It's an amber alert, and we must get busy about our father's business. Scattered everywhere. That was not the worst part of the text of Ezekiel 34. They were among these things called beasts. The beasts of the field. Beasts of the field are wild animals, also the beasts inside a man. It is that beast inside a man that's a two-footed beast and not a four-footed beast. He goes about seeking whom and what he can devour. If they don't get to church, they gonna get caught by something else. If God don't get them first, the enemy is going to try to tear them up. Go back and check your testimony. Had God not found you when he found you, where would you be right now? What would you be doing right now had he not pulled you in? So he comes now to help us, to help him, to go be his extension. Go out and get them, 2 Peter 2 and 12. But these likewise are like natural brute beasts. He said, these false teachers, what beasts that Peter is talking about, 2 Peter 2 and 12, natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed. They're brute beasts, but they're just like wild animals. They'll get caught sooner or later, and he will destroy them. Speak evil of the things that they do not understand, and says, and will utterly perish in their own corruption. So the beast is false teachers here in Second Peter, but in the text of Ezekiel, he's talking about these wild animals that are tearing people apart. They have no protection is what he's saying in Ezekiel. And when you're out there by yourself without having any shepherd protection, anybody guiding you, you are susceptible to a wild beast. If you have no teaching of the word, a solidarity of scripture, you're going to be ate up by some wild doctrine. If I'm not doing my job, you come back and tell me you I'm like, how did I, you get way over there when I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? So what are you talking about? Well, I believe there's another way, and it's called human understanding and my own belief. And mm, girl, listen, you better get Jesus in your life. You can't do this by chanting. You need the Holy Ghost. Jesus went on, and the text says, he said he healed their bodies because he was concerned about their physical healing. In, in Matthew 9, he healed their bodies because he was concerned about the physical healing. He wanted them whole. Here it is in the gospel again. The true compassion of Jesus is found in the nature of God because only God knows the full depths of compassion for individual pain, needs, and suffering. Amber late alert, the compassion of Jesus that's now given to us. He showed us compassion. Morning by morning, he shows us compassion. The problem with most of us is that we sympathize some, but we more empathize than sympathize. Sympathy is when you share the feelings of another. Empathy is when you understand the feelings of another, but you don't necessarily share in them. I, I, I feel for you, I understand. No, you don't understand. I didn't have an immaculate conception. I did not have these babies on my own, but now I'm raising them by myself. And you say you understand. You can't speak to that unless you walked in that. But if you walked in that, then maybe you can speak to that. Then you can sympathize with me to know that it ain't easy. When I came to church, I was living with someone. Now I let that go. I'm in church. I'm living by myself. You're going to tell me, preacher, that you sympathize with me? You can't tell me you sympathize with me. You got Dr. House. Listen, I'm trying to get through this thing and stay safe. When I came to church, it was church folk that hurt me, church folk that owed me money, people that was the most savers, that did the most damnable thing in my life. Now I'm in church, and here they sitting on the other side. You tell me you're going to sympathize with, you can't sympathize with me, but Jesus knows what you're going through. It's better to be in the church than to be out there with all that craziness that's going on. I'm trying my best. I sympathize and I empathize. 
I understand also I share in the feelings. The Amber Alert speaks to us in Hebrews 4 and 15. The New Living new NIV says it like this, Hebrews 4 and 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus knows everything that you're going through. He understands every up and every down, every tear, every heartache, and every disappointment. He understands what a friend we have in Jesus. And all my griefs, sins and griefs to bear, I bear them because I do not carry everything to God in prayer. Raise your right hand, said he came and got me right on time. And he put me to be the witness and now you go back and tell somebody else what I brought you out of. I want you to go back and tell somebody what I delivered you from. I, I need you to go back and overcome by your testimony and the blood of the lamb and tell somebody not only does he save, but he keeps. Not only does he keep, he delivers. Not only does he strengthen, he gives power. Not only does he give power, he gives me overcoming strength. He makes me more than a conqueror through him that loves me. Nobody could have done this but Jesus. And I'm not going to let you forget. Don't you let me forget that how he brought me out, nobody else would have brought me out. I come to church to shout before the praise team get up. I come to give God glory before anybody else say anything. The loudest person in the room is the one he's redeemed the most. Yes. Yeah. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Amber alert. Jesus. Compassion and love. How can I bridge the gap of the lost and scattered generation? That's what I've been thinking. So, okay, what do I do now? Those that were coming have come. Those that are still coming are coming. But there's a generation that's saying that I love God, but I don't like church. I don't like to be around church people. They're phony. They got all this up and up. They, they've, been, they've been saved too long. So they, they, they act like they never are thinking about doing nothing wrong, which they did. Well, anyway, which we did a few days ago. But uh, so I don't want to be around that because it's too ingenuous is not true to the person who they are. How can I help bridge this gap then, like Jesus? The Bible says he opened his eyes, spiritually and naturally, and he saw the multitude. We have to start opening our eyes, church, and see that we could be a beaconing anywhere at any time. My vision is to see this room filled with young people around a 12 o'clock service on Sunday, and they're just sitting in here buzzing. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Belinda. I went to uh, the principal of uh, Belinda's school beginning of the year. Um, stand up, Belinda, real quickly. Legacy uh, uh, High School, she's the principal. It's one of ours, the principal. Yes. God bless you, baby. I went to the high school and I prayed for the school, prayed for the faculty and the students. And I asked, I said, Belinda, how many kids are in this school? This one school she said about 3,000, 3,500, something like that. How much? 2,800 kids. I said, look at the August body of these children. They're just there. I said, wow, man, I'm going to get these kids. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going after this. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think I got y'all already. Y'all y'all good, y'all good. But it was just like, just, ooh, man, if I got a chance to get a mic in front of these kids, just give me a three-minute message. Woo! That's passion. When you see somebody, it's like, oh, yeah, you done ran into the wrong believer right now. <laughs> you should have walked down the produce aisle, girl. You, nobody should have told you not to come down this aisle right here. Ooh! And your basket starts shaking like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, no, you not gonna get. I'm the track. You ain't gonna get no track. I'm the track. I'm gonna tell you how he brought him out, when he brought me out, how he keeping me out. I'm gonna be the witness for Jesus. Yes, 
He had compassion on the multitude. He saw them. Open your eyes and see people need you. And God will give you access to them. The sickness they were walking in because they were scattered abroad. Scattered abroad. They were walking like zombies. Wasn't sick, just scattered. The text says they were weary. It's been out here a long time. I'm trying all the stuff I could try. Edibles and everything. I'm just, I'm just trying to get this weariness off of me. I'm just, I mean, I, I, did, I, I don't smoke. I don't smoke. I don't smoke. But right now, I got to get this thing off of me. Oh, God. Because I'm just. And the more they walked, the tired they became. And so debilitated. Jesus is walking the world out of them so they can get to you. So when they get to you, they're going to lean upon you like, can you help me please? Can you do anything for me? Can you tell me how I can get out of this? They were broken, walking like zombies. He said, and they're everywhere. The Amber alert goes off to the disciples. He said, what shall you all do? Do you not see the need? That's here. The harvest, verse 37 in Matthew 9, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Sadly, it is that you won't even pick them up, and they're everywhere. So since you won't pick them up, I want you to pray. Pray until something happens. Pray until the church catch on fire again. Pray until you get out of your little cute, comfortable position because all your kids are at home. Pray that the alarm does not go off in your house. Pray that the devil would take his hands off of these children. Pray to heaven moves and hell is shut down. I want you to pray. Pray till you break the atmosphere. Pray till the devil get tired of hearing you rush heaven. Pray like it's your baby that's been captured behind enemy line. Pray is like it's your grandchild that can't get taken from the hands of the enemy. Pray to you shake up something. Pray to fire get shut up in your bones again. Pray the Lord of the harvest. Pray to your neighbor can't sleep at night. I gotta go up and get to a witness of somebody down on the strip. Pray to your neighbor get to walk in the community and pass in out tracks. Pray to you wake up that fire inside of you again and stir up that gift in your spirit. Pray to the child that says I'm not gonna ever go back to church. Run to church and be you here. Pray that God begins to do a new thing in your life and in your house and on your street. There's anybody that got to pray in your spirit a pray in your heart. There is an amber alert going off and Jesus wants us to have compassion for the lost. <laughs> Hallelujah. Franklin, send that amber alert one more time. Send it out. Franklin, send it out. Send that armor alert, send it. Send it, send it. Put it on your phone. Send it. Grab somebody and say, you better listen to the sound. Come on, get on your feet. It could be you. It could be in your neighborhood. It could be your house. But if you know that it's not you, give God a thanks, a shout, a praise. He came and got me right on time. God bless you. I want to quickly pray for someone. I'm not going to have an altar prayer. It's going to be a congregational prayer, online prayer. I want you to get some names in your mind. This is a, a soul-saving 
uh, altar call. Get some names in your mind, people that you, young people particularly, that you're thinking about. Stand on your feet if you're able to stand quickly and you're thinking about them and you know that God is going to get and rescue and save them. He's going to use you and me to respond to the alarm. Don't wait till they get too old where they don't want to be around people at all. Let's go get them now. Hold those names up in your right hand. Clutch your fists like you're holding them. Father, in the name of Jesus, open our eyes to see the multitude of young people, of old, middle-aged families that need to come to you. Open my mouth that I would speak life to them and bring them home. If not particularly in a building, but definitely in the kingdom. Give me the wisdom and the words to speak salvation to them. I thank you that I heard the alarm. I thank you that somebody came and told me about Jesus. I'm grateful that I'm saved today. So let me go back and pick up somebody. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. It's my job, my responsibility. These names that are in my hand and on my mind save, heal, strengthen, and deliver in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God your best praise right now. Come on.